All right, ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back once again to the longest running show in the world about data. It's called DM Radio. Yours truly, Eric Cavanaugh, here with a couple of my best friends in the business. I'm very excited today, folks. We're going to talk about the edge, living on the edge, like Aerosmith used to sing and probably still do sing, quite frankly, when they go on tour. Living on the edge. What is the edge exactly? Well, the edge is kind of everywhere these days. The edge can be your phone. It can be a car. It can be an oil rig. It could be a sensor pretty much anywhere. And you have a sensor in some compute. So how can you edge out your competition with data? Well, there are lots of different ways. We're going to talk about that today on the show with Damian Black, a serial entrepreneur, and Diane Hinchcliffe, a longtime IT industry analyst and good buddies of mine both. And uh, wow, what's at the edge? You know what else is at the edge? robots you're watching i got this idea to reach out to diane because i saw a, a post he put on linkedin about the latest in robot technology and they're getting pretty good at stuff they're getting pretty good at just being able to read the environment around them grab things do what you ask them to and of course patch in some gen ai and they can start talking to you as well either in text or actual words so it's like woo! that doesn't mean they're sentient doesn't mean they're sentient creatures, but it does mean they could do a whole heck of a lot more. And so I guess we'll just kind of dive right in. I'll throw it over to Dion first. These new robots, they're going to be at the edge, and they're a pretty powerful force at the edge. What do you think? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you could argue that a few of them will be at the center. You know, that's where all the the data and our you know our servers and you know the, that's where the the data center is, and that's where the you know the center of the network is. But the edge is where all the action is, is where we are, is where the experiences happen. And um, robots, of course, most of them will be at the edge. They'll be in our pockets and our mobile phones and in our cars, uh, helping us self-driving, you know, quite soon. Um, but all this requires an enormous amount of data. And, you know, the, the robot you were talking about, Eric, uh, is connected over the network to, to the big brain. That can't run inside the robot yet, but that's, that's what they want. They need it to move as much of that processing power into the robot as much of that ai capability into the robot as they can because the amount of information that has to go back and forth is taking like video at 10 frames a second and it has to understand what it sees right and this is really the big issue at data management is is you know how do we make this efficient given that we're going to have millions of these things eventually you know it could be three years five years ten years it doesn't matter we have to plan for that future well and that's a really really good point and i want to get into the architecture of compute because there are some very interesting things happening and we'll also get into some of these other issues too but i remember talking to a company i'll see if i can remember the name on this show but you just reminded me about them they're in the virtual reality space and what they talk about is kind of what you just mentioned that you have to come up with a very clever architecture because in order to do virtual reality well you have to have an incredible an incredibly small latency you cannot mm -hmm. have people playing games sticking their shooting stuff when it's not there anymore it can't be a second it can't be half a second it's got to be like within a tenth of a second or something for it to work and so what they've done is they have shifted the the manner in which the compute takes place where they've kind of broken down that challenge to where a little bit of compute happens here and then more compute happens over here and it's pretty intense. I mean, that from a programming perspective, that's pretty hard to pull off, but that's kind of what we're looking at, right? Is being able to balance out the compute to know what you could do at the edge, what you have to do back at the mothership and minimize the communication going back and forth, right? That's right. Well, either you have to have a whole lot of compute at the edge and, and data storage, or you have to have a whole lot of network. That's the real compromise, right? So you can use all that horsepower and all that infinite data storage in the, in the center of the network if you have a really big pipe. But that's not practical for a lot of edge use cases because a lot of the most interesting things is out where you probably don't have, you barely have any 5G signal uh, and, you know, and satellites will help with all that. But increasingly, we really need the edge to be intelligent. We need AI at the edge. We need intelligent processing and only talking to uh, the the, uh, the data centers and, uh, you know, when we have to. Um, and, you know, Apple's Vision Pro is a great example. They had to generate a special chip, had to create a special chip in addition to the M2, that's their, their Apple Silicon super chip, to handle the 20 cameras, I believe it is, it's, 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 it's around that number, that are constantly generating all this HD video around the uh, world, around them, integrating all those data streams and making sense of them. So they did a lot of edge processing there and very little in the center, and it, and it works for them, and they've been able to achieve low latency. You know, so yeah, that's it's happening. That's crazy. I mean, it really is amazing. And to your point about at the edge, 
how you don't have a lot of connectivity. For example, another really cool company, Helium, I think they're called, we talked to, gosh, a couple of years ago. And what they're doing is using a low level radio frequency to communicate with devices such that you as a consumer can actually tap into this and get coin, get, uh, I don't think it's uh, Bitcoin. It's some other kind of coin that they're doing a stable coin or something, but basically you give up your transmission power and you're now part of this low latency network, basically that allows these little objects to talk to each other. And I'm thinking that's cool. <laughs> like, cause okay. now you can enable all this stuff out of the desert, out in the oil rigs, like all these places out on the edge. And that company I mentioned uh, to you before the show, that dot, their streaming graph can run on a Raspberry Pi. So 300 megs of RAM is all it needs. So it can be at the edge all over the place. So there are cool things happening already. The question is understanding what are the use cases and how to do something with it, right? Yeah, no, exactly. Well, if you're talking about Raspberry Pi, you know, the Pi Zero is so small, it's, you know, it's half the size of a credit card. Uh, and you use Bluetooth low energy or using some of the, the, the 5G capabilities. Uh, you can run these things for, with a tiny solar panel or even with so some Bluetooth sensors now will run for, for 10 years on a single charge. So, you know, and I think, you know, I've talked about this Eric, uh, before on the show is, you know, everything is going to get connected because it's so cheap to put a sensor in there to, to generate data. It's just that we're going to be a wash of data and people. I just, I just don't see that they're really kind of planning for this. The strategies are not there. Like what, what can I do when everything in my business is connected? Everything in my house is connected. I have total visibility. How do I manage all that? So right. it's an exciting time. Yeah, it's going to be right. Grid Raster, by the way, is the company that I'd mentioned that's doing this, oh, interesting. this distributed compute where they've kind of broken down the architecture to be able to do the real-time stuff for the person with the visual goggles on. And it's just like, wow, that's pretty cool. Let's bring in Damien Black, who knows a thing or two about the edge as well. Damien, you're looking at the world that we're looking at. It's getting crazier by the day. The drones, the cool stuff that at the edge too we've talked on the show before about drones how they're revolutionizing the insurance industry i was talking to someone at a conference i think they said it, it took like it used to cost like four to six thousand dollars for an insurance adjuster to go out to a house after a hurricane or a storm and adjust and, and see and just take mm -hmm. pictures and understand what happened to be able to process the claim like four to six grand now it's like four to six hundred because you can send a drone out there and it grabs all the information. It's got geospatial baked in. It's like, wow. And of course, no one has to climb up the side of the house anymore either. So it's also safer. But I don't know. What do you see happening, Damien? Well, it's interesting you mentioned that use case because I'm thinking uh, maybe that could help us in California. You know, there's a real crisis right now with um, all of the home insurers disappearing. Mm -hmm. Read about that. I'm leaving yeah. the state. And, um, you know, one of the things that occurs to me is that there's a um, very little smarts that's really been going on in insurance. And I think um, there's, a, there's a big opportunity for, I mean, the way you make money insurance in, in insurance is actually understanding what the real risk is and, you know, coming up with the right premium for the risk. So high risks pay high premiums, low risks pay low premiums, and then you hopefully can undercut all your competitors. I guess you get a drone that can fly in there, particularly if you're, you know, the, I think it's something like, um, I might have got this percentage wrong, but it's something about like 60% of all California housing is sort of within, I don't know, half a mile of, of, of sort of potential fire risk in terms of uh, wow. um, forests and, um, yeah. you know, natural parkland and so on. So, um, what you need to do is to be able to look at each property and, and determine what, you know, what is the true risk. And I can imagine that would be a great application for drones out there right now with edge intelligence, navigating the property, identifying where the nearest fire hydrant is, looking at the map, looking at the roads, looking at, you know, the, how the, the level of undergrowth. And I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you could do and make an assessment quite quickly. Yeah. Um, the reality, just to give you just how far and extreme we've got right now in California in this regard, with the departure of the insurers, um, there's a sort of the insurance companies have pulled together and created an insurer of last resort called Fair Plan, um, which you can imagine is not necessarily the, the fairest price. But but the problem with this was a huge spike in demand. I literally telephoned them. I I saw an error in in the quotation that was made for my house in uh, in, in Lake Tahoe. And I wanted to get hold of them because it looked like uh, they were going to basically uh, 
throw me off of the insurance plan and that would leave me completely un, you know, uninsured. It took me five hours and one minute waiting on the line to get a, to get them to answer. I mean, you you start going mad. You wonder, you know, is, and this is on a cell phone. Is it going to be dropped? Is the I mean, kudos to, to T-Mobile for not dropping the call. But five hours, one minute. Then someone answered. There was no way of leaving a number of being called back. It's literally waiting for five hours and one minute. Spoke to the person. Oh, and they said, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. That, that, uh, that correspondence was sent out by mistake. No, you're not being thrown off the plan. <laughs> Well, fact, we have, we have AI now that will actually wait on the phone for you, so it's, it's interesting. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the last time I called them, it was only about an hour's wait on the call. So things are improving. But, you know, anyway, I, we desperately could use some drones and uh, where they actually could go out there and make some intelligent assessments. I mean, they want to send out people to do in-person inspections. I mean, if they can't answer their phones, how on earth are they going to send people out to do in-person in inspections? I do not know. Well, and you know, to get to get to the edge cases again, if you will, think about train systems, think about electrical systems, power companies and all the power lines that they have. Apparently there's a power company in Texas that has essentially taken responsibility for that huge wildfire. They're like, yeah, that was our equipment that went down. Well, if you, ha you don't need many sensors, if you get a sensor every quarter mile, for example, you could start to, to wait and sense for flames being able to see flames being able to like a yeah. smoke detector basically you could have something in place that gives us early warning signals or even the drones that fly over i mean there are lots of ways that you can use these technologies to stay abreast of what's happening out there and let's face it big fat fires raging across the land that's a pretty big deal like that's a pretty big use case where you know we might want to look forward and get some of that stuff in play what do you think damien you know, in that particular case, I have heard of, uh, I've got a, a, um, a friend of mine who's an entrepreneur and who's actually working on, um, uh, what is the, what's it called now? It's basically firebots that are going out there to 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 sort of pre-burn forest area um, automatically, robotically controlled um, to sort of, you know, clear the undergrowth. Um, and I, he was talking to me about sense technology. But I think that I, my gut feel tells me that should be something done from uh, using the, the low cost now to launch satellites with sort of thermal technology and, mm. and just have a blanket of them up in the sky, monitoring continually for any unusual changes in temperature. I mean, that would be a natural, but I mean, they're also edge devices. I mean, um, so yeah. they're just, at the, <laughs> their edges, you know, a bit further away. Uh, yeah, so that's what I would, that's what I think would be the best approach, uh, I think, but, yeah, there are there are roles as well for uh, for sensors. I was involved in, for example, um, some defense projects where they're doing uh, hydrophones and um, an, an an ultrasound detection, um, sonar detection. Sorry, um, to detect movements of submarines in in the oceans around the world. Wow, because there's a lot of fear of um, you know now particularly with China investing so much in, in military. And this was an Australian project. So there are, you know, there are lots of very interesting uh, pro projects and uh, sensor uh, based um, processing wow. systems. And you want to be able to, for example, recognize from the sonar and from the hydrophones, what kind of vessel is sort of quietly wending its way through the water near you. Um, and then you can track it across those sensors. You can, try and work out the profile um and uh yeah you can, there's a, you can there's a lot that can be automated and you want them to be able to operate yes to stream information back continuously back to base often it's through fiber optic cable that's landed but you also want the autonomous you know uh, distributed um, analysis so that you 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 can take actions as quickly as possible you can raise alarms you can you know, trigger other sensors to look out and, and maybe redirect. So, there's, you know, you have a kind of a, a grid that's that's active and reactive and can sort of focus in on what, what's going on when there's an activity. And you, same thing for many security systems, in fact, in mm -hmm. the same sort of area. I've worked in some Li LiDAR-based projects, uh, and it's the same sort of thing, you know. LiDAR is amazing. I remember, I remember when I came across that, and you can now see... Of course, these old ancient structures in the Amazon, for example, because it's basically looking for density, right? It's finding the buildings and you're like, holy Christmas, 
I could find mm. sunken treasure again for the first time in uh, <laughs> in centuries, right? If I could only, instead of walking around on the beach with your little metal detector, right? You'd just be up in the plane with your LIDAR. <laughs> well, people are doing that now. They're, uh, uh, the sensor-based archaeology is a big thing now, whether it's uh, underground penetrating radar, which you can get now for very cheap. Right. And connect it to your Raspberry Pi and drag it with you on your next vacation and you make your next big discovery. So right. that's <laughs> isn't that cool? I mean, it's it's just so amazing to think what you can discover and see that's just been sitting under the ground for all these years. You know, there was a guy who found a coin in Scotland somewhere that was from the Roman Empire and is worth like fifty thousand dollars. And but in his town, they don't allow you to. The, the rule is, if you find something, you've got to turn it over to the authorities. So he's like, oh, well, he turns it over anyway. That's a good citizen right there. But there's so much potential with this stuff. But yeah, again, to your point, Damien, you have to really think through the architecture. What processing do you do at this at the node? Is yeah. there maybe um, a sort of edge data center? That's something else I'm seeing a lot too. Or you've got your big availability zones for Amazon or Microsoft or Google, but then all you have all these places in between. And so you're getting these smaller data centers that are designed specifically for the edge. Have you come across those, Diane? Absolutely. That's one of the biggest trends. And so we have these big availability zones, but to your point, Eric, you're talking about these, we need these very low latencies. And we still haven't been able to figure out how to cram these, the, the larger AIs, uh, the, the really useful ones into these little mobile devices or the robots or whatever. It requires a serious amount of compute, um, you know, super high end GPUs, that sort of thing. And so we are seeing regional types of data centers appearing for uh, to lower the la latency. Um, Microsoft is, uh, has been now uh, putting data centers inside containers, you know, and, and shipping them in container ships. When they're there, they're already completely wired, ready to go. The uh, crane just wow. puts them in place. So, <laughs> you know, they're, we're, we're getting very modular uh, and, and, you know, um, and pre-built when it comes to the, these, these local data centers that allow you for very latency sensitive applications. Um, and so, yeah, so it's very interesting. We're, we're definitely seeing regional cloud becoming a thing again. I love it. Regional and, cloud, folks. Don't and, don't touch that. That will be right back. You're listening to DM Radio. And if you want to be on the show, send me an email, info at dmradio.biz. We'll be right back. All right, folks, back here on DM Radio, talking all things at the edge with Damian Black and Diane Hinchcliffe. And, you know, I, I sit around and think about this stuff all the time, I guess, because I'm a geek and I'm in this space. But I'm always wondering, like, how can you optimize the architecture of these things and what can you do? And there are amazing things that you can do by capturing this data. And, and what I look forward to is really the explosion of alternative data. And in fact, I'll be giving a speech in New York at the Data Universe Conference next month, April 10th and 11th, on the death of journalism. And what I mean by that is what we now consider standard journalism is going to collapse, I think, under the weight of large language models coupled with trusted data from systems of record. So think, for example, with the federal government, think of the federal register. When something hits the federal register, that's the actual change that took place. Politicians talk about it all the time, but what does it really mean where rubber meets road? That's what you'll find in the register and other regulations that are passed. Well, a lot of that stuff was absolutely Byzantine and incomprehensible for 99.9% .9 of the people in the world until these large language models exploded. And now they're going to be very useful in helping average citizens figure out what do these laws mean? What do these regulations mean? How can I navigate through this? What can I do for me? And that got me thinking, well, if I can tap into these systems of record, and I'll give an example sales tax systems, right? For for counties, for example, or for municipalities, they're getting all this information in. You'll be able to subscribe to a service to see which products and services are selling at some scale, not who sold them where, because you know, want to protect the privacy of the entrepreneurs. But how interesting would that be to own a shop and see, wait a minute, what what's this new thing all these people are buying? It's some, um, maybe it's a Squishmallow, for example. I've got a 10-year-old I know all about Squishmallows, and oh my God, companies are making absolute crazy bank on Squishmallows, which is just some new way to get a teddy bear, basically. But they're everywhere, and all the kids want them. So you get early indicators of what's happening and be able to act on that. That's real information. So you're gathering from the edge, which in this case would be really the stores that are populating information for the sales tax system, and then you're subscribing to a feed to see what, what to sell. 
So Damien, I get very excited about this stuff. Uh, AI is a big part of the equation. It still, you know, is teetering a bit. Uh, some smart people I know say they rolled it out a bit too soon, but I think they had to, you know, want it to get somewhere. And I can tell you from my experience, the people at Google are very, very nervous right now because of ChatGPT hooking up with Microsoft. They're scared. I mean, I've never seen a company like Google be as concerned as they are right now. And it's because of the competition, because this stuff is so powerful, but it's still, you know, it's still not yet governed, I suppose. But what do you think, Damien? Yeah, I mean, you want to talk about this with regard to edge, I think then it's all about what we're talking about is shrinking things down. I mean, hmm. edge devices, there are sort of two, two sort of things that, that make edge compute and edge um, analytics different. It's the ability to be able to operate you know, disconnected from from the network, right. the internet, right, the central space, or where the latency, even through you know any available mechanism, is just too great to go back, you know, to and fro, um, even by uh, you know satellite or, or whatever the community, even even maybe even through you know cable, um, um, fiber optic, and so on. The the physical distance makes a difference. Um, so those are sort of the drivers, um, but there's a lot of, you know, there's a it, it's sort of stepping back, you know, we forget that we're walking around now, it, we're in a world where everybody's walking around with what would have been regarded as a supercomputer only a couple of, you know, decades ago in their pocket. The smartphone is really extraordinary and, um, and it just makes you wonder what's possible. And one of the things that happened when um, Facebook open sourced its um llm technology so a lot of hobbyists downloaded the technology onto their laptops and found ways of sort of shrinking it down hmm. so one of the big challenges is just the, the sizes of these models with all of the billions of parameters but what people have um, started experimenting with is shrinking down so instead of you know uh, say i don't know 48 bits down to 24 then you know 16 and even <laughs> ridiculously Doing basically real arithmetic in in say I don't know can't remember now 10, 12 bits something ridiculous you would think it would be utterly useless there aren't that many values you can hold but the models still sort of work when you shrink mm -hmm. it right down and and the whole driver there is to allow people to start doing comp computation and running these models you know on on laptops and smaller devices now if you step away from LLM which is you know a specific kind of uh, language kind of technology but just look at the 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 power of the neural nets coupled with the shrinking down there is a lot you can do now on edge devices um mm -hmm. you know you can train models to um if it's something that could be solved by a human being through you know years of experience the likelihood is you can train a neural net model shrink it down and run it on a pretty modest device on an edge platform and that might be uh, yeah, in a drone. Um, a smartphone in this regard would be, you know, extremely luxurious in terms of its compute capability. But there are opportunities to be able to uh, you know, change, transform the, the whole manufacturing process. Mm -hmm. Having this sort of technology available in cars, you can actually uh, capture and so on the car characteristics, driving characteristics, whether it's mechanical, reliable, and so on. Have have them recorded and um, sent the information back up to the cloud when when it's possible to connect, and have all of the retraining that's done up there, but then push back down these sh shrunken models back onto the edge so that they can actually detect you know for when you're there are problems with your engine or when there are dangers on the road or mm. problems in the manufacturing process. So I think there's a lot of really exciting you know AI driven hybrid architectures where you can still have all of the power and the, you know the mass computation that can go on in training these huge models but shrinking them down for autonomous edge um, interpretation and execution does mm -hmm. that make sense yeah well, and, and data collection so i saw a story the other day that was kind of funny someone said that they're finding strange uh devices transistors or something on the big shipping arms okay what the, mm -hmm. the, the steve or doers use which come from china so like oh are they like are they listening in and the bottom line is you can do that i mean i've thought about this whole alternative data space 
you, know, you can use it for all sorts of different reasons, but just the number of ships that come in, how many containers come off. You're like learning about what are the products coming into the country and that can help you with pricing and it can help you with supply chain. I mean, we saw how the supply chain just went wacko first with the tariffs and then of course with COVID. So we did have some lead time to kind of prepare for that. But when you start thinking about the, the ability to pull in data, like I saw another interesting story. A friend of mine gets all into this stuff. He was saying that uh, there's no way China has like 1.4 billion people. I'm like, well, where'd you come up with that? And he just says, look at the birth rates, look at the numbers, all this stuff. He's, he thinks they've exaggerated that. I'm like, well, that's kind of interesting that you would mm -hmm. even go down that road, right? But of course, you know, can we trust what their government tells us? You know, in the old days with Russia, they would just make stuff up, right? So it's like, what are they doing now? I mean, I've, I've thought a lot about, uh, and I'll just quickly tell this story, but I remember doing research back in 2002 or, or so, and I looked up that according to the World Bank, the the GDP of the United States in 2000 was about $10 trillion. The GDP of Russia, which, mind you, was the other world power. Back in 2000, mm -hmm. it was bipolar. There was us and Russia, the two world powers. The GDP of Russia was $340 billion. And I'm thinking to myself, wait a second. You know, one superpower that is 30 times the size of the other superpower? And then I just did some math in my head. I was like, I know what's going on. It's off the record. Like they've learned to skate around reporting because they want to pay taxes on that stuff. And you know, we've seen that in our country too. And you have onerous rules for taxes or, you know, all sorts of regulations, people find ways around them. Right. But I, I throw that out because it was just such a shocking number. And where I'm going with this is that with IOT, with edge devices, you can track all kinds of things like the number of cars coming into a city in a day to be able to dynamically adjust how much we need in terms of police force, in terms of traffic cops, in terms of whatever. And I think you'll start seeing uh, over time now more dynamic operations with cities and municipalities and other large entities that have to deal with large crowds coming. Because when the large crowds come, things change. You know, traffic changes. You can change traffic patterns. You can change all kinds of things. You can even notice which kinds of cars are coming off this exit into the mall. And subscribe to a services. And we got a lot of beamers coming in today. You know, let's get the good stuff out front because we know the rich people are coming in. I mean, you can actually do that stuff these days. What do you think, Dion? Well, I mean, what you've highlighted is a super important trend, which is, you know, for most of the technology's history, it's mostly we've been facing the upsides, the good things that it brings to us. Hmm. And I you know, really, one of the things I do really regret seeing is that the, the bad guys have found technology. And, and, and so the whole concept around dual use, most technologies hmm. have dual use. And so as all of our products around us accumulate all these IoT devices and edge devices, we're increasingly looking at these little bumps going, was that put there by design or did that get added? Or is it just right. being used twice for two different things? Right. Once for the, the the product, like those Chinese cranes, everyone's wondering what those what those little little sensor packages are there. The manufacturer could have easily put them there, and the CCP could have decided they also wanted to collect data out of those things. Uh, so we don't know. And the, the the reality is, is most technology has dual use, right. and when everything is covered in sensors that can capture, you know, we, we talked about smart dust. I used to track track that that's where you have these cameras that can take a 24-hour loop they're smaller than a piece of dust you can take a handful of them and super saturate an area people don't even know it's been covered in in a million cameras uh, and so it, you know you, you could go to any crime scene pick pinch a piece of the smart dust and figure out what happened there wow. that's the kind of world that we're heading into it's um and so as everything gets saturated in sensors we need really good going back to your original point eric we need a really good way to make sure these things are safe. They're being used in an appropriate ways. Uh, we have executive orders around AI here in the United States. They don't take effect till May. Uh, EU just passed their first major AI regulations yesterday uh, to try and say that yeah, you got to register your models. You you have to be transparent about how you're using this technology because we have to start chasing down dual use. That's that's going to be the next big trend. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. I'm glad you brought up transparency. I'll throw this one over to Damien. I understand. I mean, I'm a libertarian by by trade, if you will, and I'm a business person. So I understand you want to have your intellectual property. You don't want to have to reveal your secret sauce, how you do things. But when you look at these models, I mean, ChatGPT, the mo the engine that actually runs ChatGPT is incredibly complex. So in my opinion, to make it open source, is that really a threat to their market space? I don't think so. 
I mean, the fact that Facebook has or Meta has open sourced theirs is, is a pretty good sign. But as a very powerful technology to be a complete black box, which it is today. And I just wonder, I think we're going to have to. And, and I was joking with some other uh, intellectual the other day. He was saying, look, just go read the terms and conditions for ChatGPT. OK, it says don't use it for healthcare, Don't use it for banking. Don't use it for anything. Basically, just use it for fun. Like, OK, well, that's like, you know, saying don't use the lighter. Use it your own risk is what they're saying. Yeah, yeah. basically. Exactly. It's a it's a, a, a legalese way to move around this yeah, we told you not to do it but you did it anyway yeah. right right it's your fault <laughs> it's your fault for doing that but damien do you think we should mandate that these that these models are open source or you do have to register them so that is an interesting concept register what is it being used for basics of how it works what do you think damien well i don't think it's realistic to to force people to open source them um i think google was terrified when it saw the results of Facebook open sourcing its technology. There was a very popular sort of article that was released onto the internet and you can all find. And um, because of the, the the rate of innovation from hobbyists, again, the first thing they did was they would shrink them down. That was so that individual, you know, guys and girls on their computers with their connectivity can actually start innovating and they were achieving results that were on google's roadmap you know for years to come and they sort wow. of checked them off within a few months so it's wow. a very powerful in that regard in terms of controlling i mean I, the libertarian side i mean i have libertarian kind of tendencies myself you know i mean most entrepreneurs do because red tape and so on just yeah. ends up you know clogging exactly. you and dragging you down and I mean, starting off fire, hiring for equity only, you you know you're already skirting the the, the the law there. So you have to you know work out you know how that's how you're going to work uh, with minimum wage and all of those sorts of things. So there right. are lots of uh, areas there that need to be. There's always the law of unintended consequences with this sort of right. stuff. AI is definitely something which I think the, the the thing is even if you were to open source an entire model. People, the people who have created these models do not understand how they work and why they work. Right. There's a whole science that's now springing up about trying to understand, you know, what is the organ, you know, normally you will, for example, in science, you might be studying the, uh, you know, the biology of, a, of, a, of an organism, or you may want to be studying the crystal structure of some complex compound Right. Well, there's a now a science of trying to understand and look at the structure of the trained neural net. In other words, what are the concepts that it's somehow identified? How is it really working? Right. So, you know, it's um, I don't know. It's uh, even even putting all of the stuff out there. It, it will take years for people to understand right. what is really going on. What is the structure that's really being modeled here? Right. Which data, whose data has been uh, used to do this it's far right. transparent it's just literally yeah you know, think well, of it folks, as, hold yeah. on to that thought we'll yeah, be right sorry, back yeah. it's time for a break we'll be right back you're listening Absolutely. to dm radio all right folks back here on dm radio talking to damian black and diane hinchcliffe about ai and the edge and uh you know what you're saying about being able to downsize to you know 10 or 12 bits or something to be able to run these models on a laptop i mean that's pretty intense and they do things that we don't fully understand and that's the you know I, so I've, I've thrown out this analogy i'd be curious to get y'all's take on this but training ai models is kind of like raising a kid in mm -hmm. that they're going to absorb everything and you have to be very careful about what you expose them to because if you start talking trash about your neighbor and then the neighbor comes over and your kid's like, daddy says, you talk too much. You're like, what? <laughs> you weren't supposed to say that. That's what the models are doing because there's all this information in there. And what I really want to get into is how does the engine actually choose what it decides upon? And you know, there are different models. And I think rag models are the key here. And I think that rag models, frankly, are going to be the innovation wave that is going to rock the business world. Because I think what's going to happen, and uh, maybe I'll get Dion's take and then Damien, I think what's going to happen here is the RAG model is going to be your data quality engine. It's going to be your data governance engine. It's going to do some analysis. It's going to do a lot of different things to harness the power of the large language models. Because the LLMs can just spin up stuff 
according to whatever prompt you give it. But the governance and the quality checks are going to be in that rag model probably on the way out and then on the way back is my guess to like double check. OK, are all the facts correct here? Because you do want to get factually accurate information to base your decisions on. But think about the amount of ETL and security and governance, all of these other things that we've done that are discrete disciplines in and of themselves. I kind of think they're all going to collapse or go away or at least be obviated to some extent by very good RAG models hitting LLMs. But what do you think, Diane? Yeah, so a RAG is going to be how enterprise AI is really going to flourish because you can put the grounding in there. You can put the data quality checks, as you said. Um, it, it's not necessarily as good for the creative use of AI. So I think at the consumer side, you know, RAG will still has a, an important role to play, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see other models there. But the, I think a really important part of this discussion is we are in such early days. People, you know, think, you know, we've had AI for 40 years, but this AI we've only had for just literally just a few months in, right. in terms of being in the hands of a, a lot of people. Uh, and we have years and years to go. And we're learning that, that not every model is the same. That open source models and commercial models are different. Commercial models have a lot more, you know, sensitivity about where what content they've been exposed to. They control it a lot more. They curate it more. Um, they have the safety layer that's very carefully designed. And then they have the open source models, which are they 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 are you know a free for all in some cases. They're all over the place. Um, but we're learning that different size models have different uh, uh, characteristics. We should understand what type of model and what size model we should use for a, a given situation. And that really, you know, to Damien's point, uh, you know, uh, LLMs like Calypso can, that can run on a on Android, the average Android phone, not even a super Android phone, will will be useful for certain things. You know, only sometimes we have to fall back to the big giant models out there. Um, but yeah, the the um, getting grounded deterministic information out of these models is 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 what the the businesses are fo focused on. I need to know what you tell me is right, right? Um, and that's 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 one of the most important factors. And RAG is the leading way to get there. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, you're going to see a lot of innovation in that space because, again, to Diane's point, this is very very early days, but things are also moving very very quickly. I had Bob Mugley on the show last year and he was commenting on how he had a number of concerns when they first rolled out chat gpt and then like three months later he's like well actually they're already addressing some of these things so it, th these are very complex architectures and so you can address them in any number of different layers and you get what you know what people are calling guardrails for example and i've already seen a pretty big guardrail when i use gemini i asked it hey how many electoral votes are in georgia and arizona and it thought for a second it said Mm, elections are very complex. You should use Google for that. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's a guardrail. They're like, don't touch it. Don't do anything on elections because you know they're going to get in trouble for that. So that's a guardrail. But what businesses are going to want are very fine-grained guardrails and very fine-grained processes about persisting curated data in your vector database, in your embeddings. I mean, that's- And they'll want control over that. They'll, for, they'll say, here's our AI policy. I need this model to comply with that policy or cannot be used here. And right. so the, those LLM providers have to provide that configurability, which doesn't really exist today. You can do some some prompting and things like that and some uh, you know system commands, but not, not to the degree that organizations want. Yeah. Well, and, and that's, yeah. And you, know, you made another point that, and uh, my good buddy, Dr. Osama Fayyad, he is now heading up the Institute for Experiential AI over at Northeastern University, and they've got a pretty impressive operation, and he's been around it for a long time. He was the first chief data officer at Yahoo, so he's been around. He knows this stuff, and uh, he was joking to me. He's like, nobody knows how why these things work. They're not supposed to work. They're too big. <laughs> I'm like, that's pretty funny that a guy who heads up the Institute yeah. for AI is telling you, look, we don't really know what the hell's going on here. It's not supposed to work. Kind of reminds me of, uh, I told Damien my Russian story about the bad Russian. There was also the good Russian, Nikolai Menchikov is the nicest guy. Nikolai Menchikov, we talk like this, he would say, thing, the funny thing about the web is that nobody know how it works. All we know is it works, <laughs> right? And that's kind of the way it is with these large language files. Like, all right, well, we don't know exactly why they work, but we do know what they work. And that's why you need so much experimentation. You have to spend time playing with these things to understand and to codify and register. And where I was going a minute ago is uh, Kindy, 
which is a really good uh, technology that sits on top of LLMs. They got bought by Click, so they're not part of, part of Click. But what they did that's very interesting is you you could feed them a manual, like let's say a very complex manual for an iPhone or something. It'll automatically generate frequently asked questions and give you the answers it came up with, and you can curate that. But then when you give it a question, it will give you the answer, but it also gives you a drop down to show you where it got the information. So it's like this answer came from page two and page 17 and page 30. Yeah, attribution is, is so important. Yeah. Which is huge. I mean, that's, you know, you look at media, and in my opinion, what's wrong, where we've gone off track. And I know you have some thoughts on this, Damien, about advertising being a toxic effect on media, but so is the practice of anonymous sources. And anonymous sources used to be really rare, and now it's like every freaking story. It's not a story if it doesn't have an anonymous source, basically. If there's no anonymous source, then I don't believe it. That's kind of what the journalists seem to be saying. But citations are really important. Where did you get this information? The Kindy model really embraces that, and I think more and more will embrace that. And that's important, right, Damien? Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, with regard to your anonymous sources and so on, I think we're already in the world now where, well, I mean, <laughs> let's take, take the legal world where we have so many cases cited on the web of lawyers referring to fictitious, you know, lawsuits and outcomes, <laughs> which is case law, probably right. the most important place where you have to have the absolute certainty that um, the case law is correct. So journalists, it's going to be natural for them to be duped into picking up some material which they think is uh, a reasonable source. Uh, it's already making it, I, um, I'm, I'm really scared about this um, forthcoming election with all of the meddling from both China and Russia that, that's going to take part. It's going to be, most people, I mean, most people have a hard, used to have a hard enough time to program a VCR, don't know how to run a DVR. <laughs> how on earth are they going to try and work out whether information is genuine or not? I mean, it's going to be totally impossible. So yeah, I just, I I do not know what's going to happen. It's the first time we've been facing, you know, well, inexpensive to free access to AI technology, right? Um, that can be used for almost anything. I mean, it's extraordinary. Um, well, and it's so, interesting because yeah. we're going to have to go back to just trusting, to trusting sources, you know, and just, I mean, people already trust sources and believe sources. One of my jokes, because I've been in the media for a long time is I would say that you've heard the expression hear all believe half and everyone goes, Oh yeah, yeah, I, I know that. And I should only believe half, but for some reason they believe everything they've heard. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, the stuff that is unbelievable that's what someone else heard. I heard everything I heard is correct. I don't know where you got your information, but that is going to be, and it is kind of dark. We go from fake news to Gen AI, just making stuff up. You know, that's a, a bit of a post truth world, I suppose, which again, gets back to transparency and seeing what happens. And I think what's interesting is again, subscribing to information services, things that are coming from the edge. For example, if you can subscribe to this service, kind of like you would to the Bloomberg terminal years ago, quite frankly, it's the same kind of concept, but you're going to be able to subscribe to services of just streams of information of what's really happening. And I think that's going to be the future of a lot of business news, because that's very interesting stuff for a business. If I'm someone who is managing an orchard of orange trees in Florida somewhere, I'll mm -hmm. subscribe to, of course, weather services, but also just understand what the markets are, who's buying, how many oranges, where, what are they paying for it? That's all extremely useful information for someone in that industry. And it kind of takes the, the sort of journalist out of the picture and their opinion out of the picture. I just want the data that is relevant to my company that is coming from the edge we talked about oil rigs. We talked about traffic, just monitoring traffic, where stuff is going. All that kind of stuff, I think, is going to be very, very good for business. But, folks, don't touch that dial. The podcast bonus segment is coming up next. You're listening to DM Radio. All right, folks, back here on DM Radio, talking to Diane Hinchcliffe of Constellation Research and Damian Black, formerly of SQL Stream. But I think some uh, fun things are happening on his front as well. And I mentioned this talk I'll give at Data Universe, and I had this epiphany as I was sitting around the other day thinking to myself about how journalists go out, you get your stories, you talk to a bunch of people, you you know maybe do some research, and then you come up with your angle on the story and you write the story. And that's, that's interesting. That's been the past. I think what's going to happen in the future is at least for very reputable media companies, 
what will happen is the journalist will capture all the interviews, store them all in a folder, and then write their story. And you'll have access to that folder to where you can grab all that stuff, throw it into your large language model and say, give me this story uh, from the woman's perspective. Now give me this story mm -hmm. from the shop owner's perspective. Now give me this story from a, a broader market perspective, using all the same information to spin out different narratives from the data. So now you've got your your hard data, if you will, which is the interviews, the emails or whatever that you that you uh, that you had to go back and forth on that topic. And that's the meat of the story, where the story came from. But you'll be able to spin it any which way you want, which I think will be really cool because where people lose trust in media is when they think that the media is hiding the important stuff that I want to know. And they're only highlighting the stuff that fits their narrative. And that absolutely happens. Like I promise you that that happens. So mm -hmm. I think it'll be really interesting when I can just kind of play around with the raw assets of a story and get my own take on it. What do you think, Diane? Well, I think this is the the real issue with trust is without transparency, you know, you can't trust but verify. Right. And so I think open source journalism is is where it's it's going to emerge. And and I think your your other point that a lot of you know there's a lot of omission also in stories that are important. It's not just the stories that are told; it's the stories that are not told. Right. What do you do about that? And that's where open source AI journalism. I worry that journalists are maybe just too 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 biased and maybe will be susceptible, overly susceptible to misinformation because they'll be swamped with it, not because they don't want to deal with it, um, that they may not become trustworthy sources of information long term. But I think there's hope. Uh, if you look at open source intelligence, I've been tracking everything uh, using OSI uh, sources since the Russian war started, and it, it's fascinating. They take information directly from the sensors and cameras and drones, right. and they have, right. they have these these radio open uh, radio sensors on their laptops, they can capture all the different things that they hear on the air, and then they report it. Right. And they post what they see, and then they provide their interpretation. They post what they see, and then they provide the interpretation. Everyone can decide for themselves. Interesting. Uh, I think th there's a lot to that. So I think that the, the the trend is going to be we're going to have probably more AI curation. I think news has gone from well, we we consume the news to find out what's going on to we now use the news to confirm what we believe. And I think that's been a big change in the audience too, not just you know in journalism. Right. A, a right. big shift there. Uh, and so all this means is is ripe for for we have to transform it for the, the current information environment where we have way more information than we ever had before, way more misinformation. Uh, we have a, we have a, a crisis in trust and accountability and transparency, and all of it can be fixed. And and the next winners are going to be those who fix it and rise the top if there's a demand for it that's my only lingering concern is there may not be a demand <laughs> right well that is a good point i mean I, I i know in the business world people want facts right yeah. i mean there's the business world and there's the political world and as i tried to explain to my wife the other day and this is something i'm still wrapping my head around a lot of people don't realize they think in terms of like oh the two parties this and that really politics is tribal and what I mean is individual politicians have their little tribe around them, and those worlds are largely disconnected from everything else. And I mean from the rest of the people in the country, from the political parties, from the government, from the bureaucrats. You just have these groups of people that are very cohesive in a sense in that they stick together and band together, and then they sort of gather to get certain things done, like get laws passed and stuff like that. But but when people think those are the good guys, those are the bad guys, uh, trust me, man, they're all well, it used sorts to be, of yeah, little... used to be my country right or wrong. Now it's my tribe right or wrong. It's right, very interesting. right, yeah. pretty much. So you know, and we don't really talk about politics on the show for obvious reasons, <laughs> right? But when you look at the intersection of information and the edge, right? I mean, again, what's I find so cool about the edge, and you know, speaking of wildlife. There are all these cute little cameras you could put out in the forest to see which deer are coming by and to kind Bell of better understand. Oh, yeah, exactly. yeah. You, you probably guys saw the the eagles that had babies and the babies hatched or whatever. It's just so exciting that you can actually see this stuff now. And I think what's going to be cool is, and I hope these guys become truly transparent, whether it's TikTok or Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever. You know, as long as you have lineage to know where the information come came from, then you can start better understanding you know what's real and what's not and like in photography at least think about it the camera the all these digital cameras have all sorts of metadata that's associated with them the time it took what the gps said where it was when the can when the picture was taken so i think that stuff's going to come in handy 
for being able to vet. It's like, hmm, was this picture really from Avdivka or was this from last year from outside of Mariupol or something? You'll be able to get to that, I think, I hope, as, as Don said, if there's an interest for it, and I think they will be. But uh, final thoughts from you, Damon, what, uh, what can we be hopeful about in the future? Ooh, hopeful. Um, <laughs> certainly, I mean, I've got quite a lot of uh, fears about the all of the adverse uses that can be put to all of the technology. I mean, that's uh, one of the things we we're just thinking about. In fact, while we were talking was in the, in the whole security world, um, the positive side is that maybe there's the possibility now to use AI-based technologies coupled with edge delivery to get uh, distributed authentication other than the wretched password. Mm. But the other side of me is thinking, but AI could also be used to spoof in ways that have not been possible. I mean, I'm, you know, the number of services today where your voice print is your right. identification now, you know, right now, but that can be generated. We, you know, I don't know. I don't know how well they stand up, you know, the AI generated um, speech uh, impersonating somebody else. So it, it's going to be an interesting arm wrestle on both sides. And, um, and I, I, you know, I hope, and pray that uh, the good comes out and above and, and conquers and so on. Um, I do think that an interesting element, I mean, slightly off the edge, but it's related again, given that AI is going to be the sort of transformative um, technology that's going to make the edge intelligent, because you need to have that intelligence at the edge so that you can make right. autonomous decisions. Right. Um, I think it's going to be very interesting to see what happens with regard to um, how much money is required to build interesting stuff that is intelligent? Uh, because the amounts of money that we're talking about are, you know, on some of these LLM projects and trainings are greater than some countries' GDPs. Right. So, mm -hmm. There's a reason why NVIDIA's share price has gone through the roof. Uh, it's not cheap to do that. So I know there's lots of things. I honestly just don't know quite which way it's going to go. I think uh, there are lots of ways of changing everything. I do think if I were Google, I would be a little bit worried about search because I don't quite see how search as it is today will survive. Um, mm -hmm. There's got to be, it just is the most inefficient way, you know, and in fact, trying to find i was reading recently the only answers that you actually get that are sort of organic search even now have been rewritten by google to make sure that they uh can contain stuff that if you click through they make some money out of so the idea of having an ai based uh, technology along the lines you were saying where you can basically look at the all of the connected information of the world in the way that you wish and have it go through and assemble information and deliver you what you're really looking for, I think is going to be truly transformative. And um, there, I, there are a number of, I think, absolutely um, killer applications uh, that I'm sort of working on in the back of my mind on a business plan that I think will transform uh, the world as we know it. Um, and yeah. some of them are quite simple. I love it. Well, folks, look these gentlemen up online, Damien Black and Diane Hinchcliffe. It's always a pleasure talking to you, gentlemen. Send me an email if you want to be on the show, info at dmradio.biz. We'll talk to you next time. You've been listening to DM Radio. Thank you.